Monday, and that so happens to be the day that I like to talk about monsters. I'm Jeff Arbuckle, and this is Monster Mondays, presented to you by Film Seizure. Last week, we talked about a remake of a famous movie, and this week, it's a movie that had a somewhat famous remake of its own, and that's 1953's Invaders from Mars. This is a pretty popular movie with a lot of significance, and it's directed by one of the greatest art designers in early Hollywood, William Cameron Menzies. Menzies won a couple of Oscars in his lifetime. At the very first Oscar ceremony, he won for two movies, The Dove and Tempest. In 1940, he got a special Oscar given to him for his work on Gone with the Wind for, quote, outstanding achievement in the use of color for the enhancement of dramatic mood. And considering that Invaders from Mars was made in the early 50s by an independent studio, hiring Menzies probably also meant that he was going to require that the movie was made in color. Um, And that's probably partly why Invaders from Mars was made on a near $300,000 budget for only 77 minutes worth of film. And it seems a little expensive for an indie film at its time, but it's also most definitely culturally significant and really not without some kind of star power there. Aside from Menzies being in the director's chair, you also have uh, Arthur Franz, who would go on uh, from here to the Kane Mutiny the following year. And uh, this movie was shot by John Seitz, who was nominated many times Uh, for cinematography, having just come from When Worlds Collide a couple of years before. Uh, The film also uses a wonderful trope of the boy who cried wolf, though as much uh, as it feels like this movie owes a great deal to that story, a handful of movies, including Phantasm and The Iron Giant, owes a great deal to the influence of Invader's from Mars uh, in its plot points or reference material. So, uh, much like the movie, I'm not going to waste much time here. Uh, With only 77 minutes, you can't waste any time whatsoever in the plot. So, after one of those kind of classically scientific voiceovers about the mysteries of space and life on other planets, even in our own solar system, we meet David McLean, played by Jimmy Hunt. Now, David is interested in astronomy and initially wakes up early to witness a not often seen phenomenon, but is ordered back to bed by his doting mother. Now he later awakens to what seems to be a very loud thunderstorm, but what he actually sees and witnesses is a flying saucer land. Now David's father, who is also a scientist, uh, is eventually convinced to take a look at what might have landed uh, in this kind of sand pit field that's uh, just on the edge of their property. Well, when he returns several hours later, he's acting kind of strangely and has a bizarre puncture wound on the back of his neck just below the hairline. Now, a clever thing that this movie does is show how the titular invaders from Mars hide themselves. They're burrowed into the sand pit and uh, can move the sand around to kind of suck people underground into their spaceship. And after David witnesses a neighbor girl fall into one of these sinkholes, he tries to get help from the police. And he's a basically placed into protective care at that point of uh, Dr. Pat Blake, who's played by Helena Carter. And Helena Carter was actually a model for a little while, and this was her last movie, which is kind of interesting because she's actually really quite likable in this movie. But I digress. Eventually, Dr. Blake uh, begins to kind of buy in to David's seemingly nutty story. As more and more people begin to act bizarrely, uh, Dr. Blake flexes her muscle to uh, essentially keep David under her care after she corroborates what uh, David is likely telling, uh, that he's likely telling the truth, I should say, with uh, her astronomer astronomer friend, Dr. Stuart Kelston. Now, Kelston surmises that Mars is the closest to Earth that the current time based on their orbits So the ship that landed in the sand pit uh, behind David's house is likely a vanguard from a mothership in orbit and is probably came from Mars due to uh, the ease to be able to reach Earth. And I think there's been a long standing belief that Mars uh, would have an older civilization 
than Earth, uh, just because of its positioning and the fact that it's a little bit further out, which means that it would have gotten its life earlier. But I, again, I digress there. Um, it's also becoming quite clear that there are several people working around this research facility town that are high targets due to either scientific knowledge and or military standing. And uh, that makes things a little bit more difficult, but Kelston does have a little bit of, uh, he has a little bit of standing. So he's able to speak to the right people to get uh, army forces mobilized to the area that take on the impending threat. Now, after the little girl who was taken by the Martians dies, Dr. Blake uh, finds the little control probe that was uh, inserted into the people's brain stems. And the little girl's was exploded that caused a brain hemorrhage. So she just basically keeled over. Um, and the army works to duplicate the probe so that they can use it to locate where the alien signal is coming from so that they can attack them. And they finally find a way into the underground base that the Martians have created. Meanwhile, David's parents are taken to the hospital uh, after they've had a car accident where it will be attempted to remove the control device in their necks. As Dr. Blake tells David that his parents have been found and taken to the hospital to be operated on, uh, Dr. Blake and David are sucked into the ground uh, by the Martians and they plan to implant her with one of the devices. But just as they are about to take her, the army is able to find a way right into the ship and take the fight to the Martians. And we meet two different kinds of Martians on the ship. First is the larger mutant goons and then the leader that controls them, uh, who's basically a little guy in a bubble that is mostly just a bust with some weird tentacle things on his shoulders. They save Dr. Blake at the last second, but the Martians decide that they need to beat a hasty retreat. As the ship is about to take off and, take, uh, and get away, uh, the army is going to blow up the ship. Now, in this sequence, it's very fascinating how they do this, but as David is running from the impending big boom, he thinks back over the things that have happened to him in the course of the movie until he finds himself uh, in his bed waking up from what he thinks is a dream. And he finds his parents normal again and convinced that it was all a dream. Or was it? David sees a flying saucer land out by the sand pits all over again. So three things. Uh, that I want to talk about that I like about this movie. Again, of course, if you've tuned into this show before, you know that no matter the quality of the movie, good or bad, this one's a very good movie, by the way, uh, I always pick three things that I highlight that I like about the movie. First and foremost, I really like how um, the, the trusted source of information is this little kid, David. Um, and all he has to do is find one person, say Dr. Blake, that believes him and it basically is able to spread from there. It's, it's, uh, it really kind of mirrors that expansion of those who are taken and controlled by the Martians. It, it's, you find one person, then they find people, and it and it's basically starts to kind of build upwards incrementally. I talked about the blob also having a storyline that involved youngsters basically becoming the heroes through just being sincere and calmly understanding that they're up against something strange. And it, it works similarly here, but with a littler kid who is not known for buying into or trying to sell like crazy sci-fi stories. Uh, so he's treated as an authority in this. Uh, a lot of the story hinges on young actor Jimmy Hunt because he's our emotional point of view character who is concerned about his parents, the town, the idea that his planet's being invaded by something that is hard to understand or know how to combat. So again, it's, it's one of those really kind of cool ideas where you have somebody who wouldn't normally be taken as a hero getting the opportunity to be a hero. And I, I like that in this movie. Second, I really love the Martian stuff in this movie. Of course, there's the flying saucer at the beginning, and it's like that super classic one at that. You know, like it's the, it's, it looks like when you say the word flying saucer and you've seen at least one movie with a flying saucer, this is exactly what you would expect for it to look like. 
But once the army finds a way into the caverns that the Martians have made from their ship under the sand pit, uh, it's almost like something out of the Nintendo game Metroid. Uh, they have like these bubbly walls in the cavern. Um, the lead alien is just this little dude. It's just a little tiny dude in a glass bubble. And he kind of looks like a squid or an octopus or something. And he's also got this kind of glowing crystal-like thing in his head that he uses to communicate and command the people around him. And the stuff. It's, it's just... You know, it's just kind of a funny little thing that actually works, especially in the in the time period that the movie um, came out. But, you know, then he's got his goons who are big, tall, green skinned and bug eyed mutants. And of course, naturally, the ship, uh, when you go inside it, is very barren and cold and gray in color as well. It's just a very classic idea of how aliens might be really different from us. And it's, you know, very organic in nature and uh, and in its construction as well around the ship. Now, thirdly, this is one of the major pillars of the Space Invader sci-fi movie that uh, is really just an allegory for Cold War Red Scare type of business. A huge fear in people always has been the loss of their own control and free will. A big play on that fear post-World War II was that the Soviets would come in and not just change the way of life that you have, but maybe change the very way that you think. Um, And, you know, a a big thing that was used in the battle against communism was the concept that, you know, commies are anti-religion, which isn't exactly true, but it was sexy as all hell to say and easy to convince the God-fearing people of America, particularly in the Bible Belt. So if we were to become communist, our ideas of religion and what we believed in and what our faith would be, uh, would essentially be eradicated at the end of a gun. Um, And another big fear was the seditious people who were either spies or communist actors who were trying to change the country from the inside out. Uh, you You think you know your neighbors? Well, you better make sure you keep watching them because they may be secret commie pinko uh, you know, out to destroy Lady Liberty and all the apple pie your sweet old grandmother has cooling on the windowsill. But the idea of a communist takeover in America in the 50s was scary to a lot of people. And it is something that has made a bit of a return even today in the current political landscape. But sci-fi of the 50s really spiced it up with a lot of extra scary stuff that could mask that whole takeover idea and some pretty extraordinary stuff. Uh, but that's uh you know that's one of those things that that's just makes this really fascinating is that the idea that you don't really know each other or that you expect one thing from one person but it's something else so they must have been poisoned by some idea or some concept so it's just a fascinating thing that was done in a lot of sci-fi movies of the era So that wraps up this week's Monster Mondays. Don't forget to check out new episodes of Film Seizure every Wednesday and a new installment of Monster Mondays each Monday on FilmSeizure.com, as well as places where fine podcasts are found like SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Google Podcasts, Stitcher, TuneIn, Spotify, and we've uh, recently uh, gotten on to um, Amazon through Audible. So you can check us out uh, almost everywhere where you can find quality podcasts like our own. Additionally, hop on over to Facebook and Twitter to follow us by just searching for Film Seizure. And while you're at it, head over to my website, www.bmovieenema.com, and read new text articles each and every Friday. And if you want to watch a movie, there's now an episodic B-Movie Enema series now on YouTube. Uh, New episodes will be coming out every Saturday from uh, January 2nd to March 27th, 2021. So come watch a full movie with me on YouTube or by searching for B-Movie Enema on YouTube or just go over to the B-Movie Enema website. So until next week, stay spooky.